Well, what a great introduction. Thank you very much for that fantastic movie. Um, I can see myself dreaming about producing electricity from the oceans, and um, that has gotten into reality over the last couple of years. So, Minesto is a Swedish based company, and we have a subsidiary in the UK. And what we do is that we produce electricity from tidal and ocean currents. Um, when we looked at wind power about 10 years ago, we saw an issue with very large structures trying to create electricity from a very low dense medium, such as the air. And what we did is we developed a technology that goes into the water, where we have about 830 times more density than in the air, and we're using very little material because we can accelerate the velocity in this way of, um, of producing electricity. And the ocean is a very fascinating place on Earth. Um, when you look at it in more details, you realize that the ocean is constantly moving. There's always currents going on. There are ocean currents based on salinity difference and heat differences, and there's tidal currents going on because the Earth is always rotating and uh, because of the gravity of the moon and the sun. So when we looked at this great potential of energy, just to give you an example, the Gulf Stream itself is about two petawatt, which is equivalent of two million power, uh, nuclear power plants. So there's a lot of energy around in the oceans. And when we quantify this, uh, and we got some help from the UK government and different uh, subcontractors to do this, we realized that Minesto itself, with our technology, because we're going for low velocity currents, uh, we have a market potential of about $300 billion per year in electricity sales. And that number is a practical, called the practical resource. It's only a fraction of the theoretical resource. Uh, so this can solve a lot of issues around the world. And we have defined two market potential for us. It's tidal market and ocean current markets. And what's interesting with the tides is that they're very predictable. As long as the Earth is spinning and we have the moon, we can, by the clock, say, well, in this place we produce this much electricity in 25 years. We know that exactly because it's very predictive. And the ocean current is a constant flow. So that means that we have a constant electricity production and we don't have the intimacy issues as we have in wind and solar. So when we look at this, we are a complementary technology. So together with wind, together with wave, together with solar, we can actually transfer from fossil fuels into completely renewable energy sources when we combine all the different type of, of technologies out there. This industry is still very young. I mean, there's about 10 and a half megawatts installed of total capacity in the world from tidal uh, technologies and zero um, in ocean currents. Um, but during the last couple of years, we've seen a great improvement because some of the really big OEMs, such as Siemens, ABB, DTNS, and Kawasaki are moving in, and they're investing a lot in this. Um, and that means that we also see some really large utility-scale projects around the world, which is being developed. And that has created a momentum when our customers, such as Iberdrola or EDF, are now starting to really invest in marine energy. But there has been an issue in marine energy, and that is that most of the technologies look like wind power, meaning big turbines and a lot of material. And they're also static, horizontal axis turbine, and that means that they need very strong currents or fast currents to produce a lot of electricity. Um, so if you look at the competitive landscape, we see sort of the first generation technologies, which looks like underwater wind power plants. Um, they weigh between 150 and 300 tons per megawatt. Um, and they have a turbine rotor of between 18 to 25 meters. So they become very big, very heavy, and therefore high capex. And the operational cost also becomes quite high because they're uh, difficult to transport. So we now see a second wave of technologies coming out. They're trying to identify what the issues have been and how to solve those problems. And Minesto is one of them where we look at the low velocity currents and trying to increase the power output. So our technology called Deep Green. So how does it work? Well, I think most of you have flown a kite sometime. And you can see that the kite is flying faster than the wind. 
And that's the principle that we have. So we took a wind power plant, we took away the big tower and two of, of the blades, and we just put a tether on one of the blades on our wing, which is going to be 12 meters in wingspan, and under the wing, sort of on the belly of the wing, that's where we have a turbine and a generator, and this is tethered. So what happens is when the tide or ocean current comes, it creates a lift force on the wing, and we use this lift force to accelerate this whole body. We can accelerate with a factor of 10. So at one meters per second in current, our kite is flying in 10 meters per second. So if we want to produce 500 kilowatts at one and a half meter per second, if you have a horizontal axis turbine, you need a, a, the diameter, diameter to be around 32 meters um, of, of the turbine, whereas we need only one meter in diameter on our turbine. So that's a significant reduce of material that we can have by using this principle. And when you go into energy production, eliminating cost is key. We talk about renewables, our environment, but that's not what our customer is really focusing on. They're focusing on cost. So to reduce cost, you have to really look at the complete supply ch chain. And just to give you an example, on the upper picture there, you see an installation of uh, a competitor's turbine. It weighs 300 tons, and you see the type of boat that they need to do that. <coughs> that boat costs around $200,000 per day to rent. So if you have a mechanical fault or something, you need to pick it up it becomes very uh, expensive. Whereas we can use these type of small vessels that cost maybe $5,000 per day to rent. And that decreases the operational cost significantly. So we have reduced both capex cost because little material <coughs> and operational cost because we use very small vessels. So when we look at this, we see that we can compete with conventional technologies for electricity production. And for us, it's been <laughs> Um, it's been very important to make sure that we can produce electricity without any governmental subsidiaries. And when we compare ourselves, we see that we have the same cost of energy as advanced nuclear, coal or gas, uh, and that's obviously key to develop these type of uh, new energy systems for renewables. And <clears throat> last year, we had um, a quite interesting year because we actually started producing electricity. And something called Power Technology Magazine decided to give us uh, the honor to be one of the top power technology innovation breakthroughs in 2013. And <clears throat> what we do is that we have a complete power plant installed. It's been producing electricity for over a year. Uh, we're now focusing on performance and design freeze to go into the commercial rollout. We've also been very successful in doing this very cost-effectively because we have been able to look at the industry and the first-generation developers to what they have done good and what they have done wrong. And we have probably spent about a fifth compared to other developers so far in our development but just making wise decision. <clears throat> and we can have a really major impact. Um, just around this area, the Gulf Stream could supply about 30% of the energy to North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. And it's a constant flow, so it's a base load into the grid. And we have the te technology and know-how how to actually do this. And that involved into a memorandum of understanding with Florida Atlantic University, where we're today trying to get the first device into the water in the Florida current outside of Flo Fort Lauderdale. So, this award can be really important for us just for that reason, because if we get this award, we can kickstart the design <coughs> of doing a surface-mounted structure that we can install in this about 300-meter water depth. And that's going to be very important for us to get that going as fast as possible, prove that here in the state, and get companies like Florida Power and Light involved and commercialize it in big scale. So, when you develop a technology, it's very important to also develop your market. And since this market doesn't exist, really, we've been very much focused around the world. So we have collaborations in Japan. <clears throat> we have a R&D project in Taiwan with National Taiwan Ocean University. We have a project with the UN in Maldives to install one megawatt. Um, because Maldives' cost of electricity is about 
eight times higher than you have here in the US because they transport diesel out to the island and that's how you get the electricity. And when you consider it that about 700 million people live on islands, that's a big problem for the world. So if you can get renewable sources on all these islands, that will be a significantly, have a significant impact on the environment that we're living in. And obviously, a significant impact on the local economy and for the people living there, because we can reduce the cost. Our main focus, however, is in the UK at the moment. We are, that we have our R&D development platform and we are developing the first 10 megawatt array <clears throat> that's going in construction in 2016. So this is our commercialization roadmap. We already have a device in the water that's been there for one and a half year. Um, the next step is to get the first ocean current device in and that's what we plan to do next year in Florida. And in 2017, we start producing electricity to the UK grid, and by 2019, we have somewhere between 10 and 15 megawatts. That's how we produce the commerciality of this technology. That's when the utilities will come in and start ordering larger arrays. So if we summarize what we do, is that we unlock <coughs> a completely new tidal market. Since we can go for the lower flows, we pretty much double the potential for tidal energy in the world. And so far, we are the only known technology that can do this. It has very high efficiency because we accelerate the velocity through the turbine. And that means that we have very small size and weight, meaning that we can transport our technology and manufacture it to completely different costs than we have seen in this industry so far. And then, <clears throat> since we're going for lower flows, we can go into the ocean currents which is the constant flow, and we see that all over the world, and it can have a significant impact in stabilizing the grid. So with all this, we think that at Minesto, we have the technology, we have the capabilities, and we have the will to really have the power to change the future. So with that, I want to thank you very much and take any questions. Great stuff, Anders. <laughs> Questions? No questions. <laughs> Here comes a couple. <laughs> um, how exactly do you convert the motion, the energy of the motion of your device to electrical energy? Uh, how do you do that? How is the yeah. So under the wing, we have a turbine. <clears throat> and that turbine is a direct drive into the generator. So that's where we produce the electricity, and then we transport it down to the seabed and then into shore. And everything that's on the seabed and into, sh into land is similar as offshore wind, so that's already developed technologies. So we're just developing our power plant. Great. Yep. Right. We're here. Uh, fascinating presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious about the impacts um, on marine life, um, similar to the issues that um, wind turbines have had with uh, birds and bats. Just Sure, thank you. Uh, very relevant question. So what we, and the really honest question is, we don't really know because we haven't done it yet. And that's why it's so important to get it out there. But what we have seen from <clears throat> other type of structures, as you spoke about wind and so on, is that animals are quite good to adapt. And in the area where we are in Ireland, it's one of the highly, most highly populated areas for seals. So we monitor seals with underwater sonars and we have what we call mammal observers on land with binoculars looking at them. And we can see that they are in the area where we are, but as soon as the turbine is running, they stay at about 50 to 100 meters away from the turbine. And since we are, have excluded sort of a, a gearbox, which is important because that's a lot of sound, that means that we, it doesn't seem like we are distracting any type of animals, dolphins, seals, fish, and so on. And there's actually some positive aspects of when you install this in an array, you can't fish there, so you get sort of sanitaries for fish and underwater structures. If you design them correctly, use the right material, it's like an underwater reef, so you can actually have a better environment in those areas. But it is, it is a key question to ensure that you don't have a negative impact on the environment. And one more. How do barnacles affect the performance? Uh, good question. Uh, we're quite deep, so we're under uh, the magnetic zone, so we, don't, we have marine growth, and it's a um, but since we're also constantly moving, and we do service and maintenance about two times per year. So during that time, we see that we don't get too much marine growth or barnacles on it, but barnacles would destroy the hydrodynamics of it. 
So there might be a need for uh, sort of silicon paint on some of the more hydrodynamic sensitive areas to make sure that we don't get uh, growth. But since we're quite deep, not so much sun there, uh, and all this moving is not, not too bad. Right here. Uh, you mentioned 100 terawatt hour uh, capacity out of the Gulf Stream, which would be enough to power most of the southeast United States, according to your figures. Mm -hmm. If I have that right, that's about a 12, 11, 12 gigawatt um, yeah, the farm, yeah. essentially, on that level. That's an awful lot of generating capacity. It's something rather on the order of Tennessee Valley Authority, perhaps mm -hmm. a significant fraction of that installation. Have you done any modeling of what that does with respect to the thermal transfer properties of the Gulf Stream itself yeah. when you're looking at extracting that kind of power? Good question. Yeah, so um, what we've done is that we, our power plant takes out about 1% of the velocity that passes through the area where it's operating. Um, so that means that this, the amount of energy that we take out doesn't uh, affect the current, what we have seen so far. <clears throat> but obviously there is a maximum, that's why I talked about there's a theoretical resource and a practical resource that we need to care about and ensure that we don't take out too much energy. Um, so far none of our simulations and work which we do with universities such as Fatkad University and Queen's Universities and, and uh, some other researchers show that Distraction of energy at this small scale will have a major effect because the currents are so strong uh, uh, and for example the tidal currents is a, is a constant movement so it comes back and forth so we don't see any negative effect from that. Great. Well, thank I guess you very what we much. got. Anders, thank you very much. Thanks for Good having stuff. Me.